Welcome to Emmanuel Christian Seminary in the Thompson Center as we begin our 2011-2012 academic year and that also begins our Emmanuel Institute's year. So you're here for the first seminar of this season. Uh, Very pleased that we're uh, continuing on with a series of uh, presentations that began more than two years ago on the theme of the multiple roles of the preacher And tonight is part six in that seven-part series uh, entitled, The Preacher as Vision Caster. Our presenter tonight is Glenn Schneiders. Glenn is the founding pastor of the Crossroads Christian Church in Lexington, Kentucky. That church will have its 25th anniversary uh, next November. Uh, I had the pleasure of uh, uh, being a colleague of Glenn's in the very uh, beginning of that particular church, even had the pleasure of attending service once at the Shoney's restaurant where that church began so many years ago. Uh, Glenn has had two pastorates in his uh, uh, ministerial career, uh, at the Crossroads Church, of course, and also at the Rising uh, Sun Indiana congregation where he began as a student minister when he was a student at Cincinnati Bible College and, uh, and seminary where he uh, completed his uh, ministerial academic work. Uh, Glenn and I have been uh, partners in the church planting world of uh, the Stone Campbell movement for many, many years. Uh, Glenn is uh, not only an accomplished church planter in his own right, but one of the finest church planting coaches that I've ever known. And certainly if uh, I ever was asked to recommend a coach, Glenn would be my very first choice. He's someone who understands the minister's heart and understands the gospel's call. And I think tonight as he shares from his own experience there at the Crossroads Christian Church in Lexington, how he has endeavored to be God's instrument as a vision caster, you'll capture that. Throughout the presentation tonight, there's going to be several uh, brief video vignettes that will be shared to illustrate things that uh, Glenn is talking about. And as always, we will conclude tonight at 9 p.m. So in just a moment, I'll have Glenn come and we'll welcome him. But let's go to the Lord together and ask his blessing on our time here this evening. Heavenly Father, we thank you tonight for the men and women here at Emmanuel Christian Seminary that many years ago had a vision for this thing that we refer to as the Emmanuel Institutes. Thank you for their uh, casting of that vision and for the opportunity that all of us have uh, month after month to live that vision out in sessions such as this one and a unique one on the vision casting work of the preacher. I pray your blessing upon Glenn Schneiders as he comes to share his heart and from a wealth of experience. Give us teachable minds and receptive minds as we listen carefully to what he has to say and dialogue with him. And Father, I praise you for this entire series on the preacher. We value that very special role and function. And for those that are here tonight in that role as a preacher, I I personally ask a a full and rich uh, anointing upon each of them for their work. And for all of us who have a preacher that we can call friend and pastor, show us how we can lift uh, those individuals up to be even more effective in your kingdom. For this evening, we praise you and we honor you through Jesus Christ. Amen. Everyone, welcome Glenn Schneiders. Well, it's, uh, it's great uh, being able to be here with you. Uh, I, uh, the last time I was here, uh, I got a chance to see uh, the idea of this building and the, the idea of the Institute coming uh, together. And so it's, it's fun to be able to participate in that and uh, just honored to be able to try and give you a little bit of insight uh, from me. Certainly don't consider myself an expert in any way, shape, or form. Uh, being 
regard to this, but what I wanted to do, and I thought it would just be helpful, is I want to just let you see this subject, the preacher as a vision caster, lived out in the last 24 years at Rising, and not Rising Sun, I saw Steve Trinkle over here, at Rising Sun is where I used to be, but at Crossroads Christian in, in Lexington, Kentucky. Because I think that the important thing for me is to be a practitioner. You know, it, it's not to talk in theory, but rather to just let you see that played out in 24 years and, and try to give you a chance to, to play that out in your situation or maybe a future situation that, that may be a part of yours. You know, a number of years ago, um, I had a, uh, my friend on staff call me and said, I've got a deal for you. He said, a friend of ours, David, uh, is graduating uh, from medical school in, in LASIK surgery, and next week he'll be a doctor. But this week, yeah, this week, we can get LASIK surgery for half price from him. And then next week, he's also moving to Wyoming. And, uh, and so three of us, I'm still shocked at this, but three of us, you know, for half price, went and got our eyes slit open. And uh, my wife to this day says, you know, I cannot believe that, that you would do that. I'm a, I'm a pretty calculating guy in a lot of ways, but the money thing just drove me on this. And I, <laughs> I, I, I've been, you know, nearsighted all my life, you know, get up in the night, I can't read the, you know, the clock or whatever, uh, playing sports, having to have glasses, going to the beach and not being able to see what, which direction the ocean was. So the, the idea of being able to see clearly was just exciting to me. And I remember uh, one of our staff wives was the first one. She had it done. She came out and she had her husband helping her along and she's pretending like she can't see. <laughs> okay, so I have it done and I can't open my eyes. It is hurting me like crazy. I'm coming out pretending I can see because <laughs> I don't want to let, let on that I'm struggling. We get out in the, in the lobby of this area, a rather large area, and my wife's taking off the car, and I said, Marilyn, come, come get me. I cannot, I, the, the, the light is just bothering my eyes. And I went home, uh, and uh, she, she fixed me chicken noodle soup, and the noodles kept falling off my spoon. I couldn't see them. And went to bed, slept, and I woke up with 2015 vision. And to this day, these glasses are, are for the reading aspect uh, of my eyes, but I can see 2015. And it's, it's amazing what it's like to be able to see so clearly. And, and what I want us to think about is, is, is this whole idea of what's it like as church leaders when we can really see where God wants to take the church clearly. And so that's what I'm just going to try to do. Uh, I'm going to give you just examples from uh, Crossroads and, and my experience there. Uh, it, it happened in Rising Sun as well, but I think a, a lot more clarity for me uh, over these, these last 25 years. I will say that I'm thankful the Institute is doing this because nobody taught me this stuff in college. Uh, you know, I, I had one class on business administration at Cincinnati. It was a two-hour class uh, by a professor that's no longer, uh, no longer around. And, and, and it was just, it, I, when I look at my life and think about how important that whole leadership component is to the church, I'm just grateful that you're doing this. I think that's such an important thing. And so hopefully there'll be something of value in this that'll, that'll benefit some of you. You know, the scripture we're all familiar with in the King James in Proverbs 29, verse 18, it says this, this way, where there is no vision, the people perish. And, and the fact of the matter is, a clear vision is essential to a healthy church that makes significant impact in a local community. And that's not to say we can't have impact. But, but when we have that razor focus... When we have clarity around those issues, it just is significantly different. And I would suggest, uh, and I'm not alone in saying this, that there's a leadership crisis within the church today and that pre preachers must lead effectively through clear vision. Uh, people are looking for the church. They want the church to be the answer. And I fear that in many churches today, the vision is to show up and to do it all again. You know, it, it, is, it is not a clearly thought out perspective. And, and someone said this, and I couldn't, I couldn't remember where I got this, but men will never cast off their dearest pleasures for the drowsy request of someone who doesn't even seem to mean what he says. 
Have you ever visited a church, maybe on vacation, or you're just you're just in a different locale, and you come in, and, and the guy gets up there, or the gal gets up there, and is speaking, and you think, man, I don't even think they believe this. You know, there there is just no energy, there's no excitement, there's no enthusiasm. You look out in the in the pews or in the chairs, and you just see people that are just going through the motions. And I think a lot of that has to do with vision. And, and a lot of that has to do with whether this is a calling or just simply a career. This is just another job. When it's a calling, when we have this mandate from God, then we, we have to have this, this sense, what does God want me to do? And I, and I think the danger with some of this is to think that, that for all of us, that's the same. You know, and, and in some ways it is. But when you are able to figure out how that translates through your personality and your giftedness and through your, your church community, when that all gets enmeshed, it gets really good. It gets exciting. I was talking to somebody that was saying to me before this that they're, they're having more fun in ministry than they've ever had. And isn't that the way it should be? Isn't there, shouldn't it be that sense that, that it is with excitement we get a chance to do what we do? And I also realize that having done this for 24 years and another 13 in Rising Sun, so a total of 37 years, that it gets hard. And it gets draining. And, uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that. But let me just give you a, a little sense of, of Crossroads. 24 years ago, we started Crossroads. There were actually 60 applicants that had applied uh, for this church plant in Lexington, Kentucky. I called a friend of mine, Roy Mays, at Southland Christian Church. And we were talking about another matter. At the time, I was a trustee at, 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 at Cincinnati, at the college. And I was talking to him about a matter with regard to that. And at the end of the conversation, Roy said to me, you wouldn't be interested in starting a new church, would you? Well, I had heard a guy speak in southern Indiana at a men's gathering about this idea of church planning being the most effective way to reach new people with the gospel. Again, for you all today, that makes perfect sense. But 24 years ago, that was kind of new news. Uh, when I graduated uh, from seminary, if you, if you couldn't get a church job, you started a church. It, it was not... It was not viewed as the finest and the best, which is exciting to me today as a coach of church planners. I mean, I'm, I think we're getting some of the brightest and some of the very best. But 24 years ago, that was not the case. That was, that was just beginning to, to gain some traction. And so they actually, 60 guys applied. They had actually offered the position to one guy, but he wanted too much money. And so they were still looking. And I, so I called a couple guys I knew in Lexington, and I said, I'd, I'd be interested in talking to you. And... Uh, they knew me a little bit, and, and so they, they said, sure, we'll let you come down and interview. So I interviewed, and I, I talked afterward to one of the search committee guys. He's actually the camp manager. His name was Ralph Byers. And Ralph said to me, he said, you know, of the, of the applicants we've talked to, you're the only one that had a vision for this church. You're the only guy that didn't come in and say, well, we just love Lexington, Kentucky. We're big UK fans, and we'd love to be here. Now, here's the thing you got to know about me. I, I was not a UK fan. Uh, I never had any desire to live in Kentucky. I also, one time it said, uh, years, years before that, I, I will never live in a river town. And I spent 13 years on the Ohio River in Rockland, <coughs> Indiana. So I, I learned also that God will do with you some things that you don't think you're going to do. But again, it was, it was interesting to me. He said, you're the first guy that really presented a vision for what you thought this new church needed to be. And I, I can actually remember, uh, uh, I had to do a trial sermon, and so I got introduced, and I'm living in Indiana, we're in Kentucky, and so there's a huge rivalry there, and, and Roy Mays introduces me, and he tells this joke uh, about Bobby Knight. Huge laughter. So then I tell a joke about Kentucky. It's crickets in the room. <laughs> there, is, there is no laughter. And right then and there, a very important point about understanding your culture. <laughs> the number one religion in central Kentucky is the University of Kentucky Wildcats. 
And I have, I have become a fan. You know, my, my girls uh, have definitely been that. But I went to, uh, again, there wasn't a lot, there, there wasn't organizations like Stadia and other great organizations to help church planners. So I went, I, I called two guys that I knew that were doing uh, good church plants in, in a way that was beyond a storefront, that, that really had a, a desire and a sense that it was going to be something significant. Not, not, not talking about size not being significant, but, but where they, they really had a vision for uh, this being the start of a, of a great church. And one of them said to me, you know, Fuller does this thing called How to Plant a Church. And as it turned out, like the next week, they were offering it at Anderson, Indiana. And so I went to that How to Plant a Church seminar, and, and I, I heard a guy uh, talk about uh, telemarketing, of all things, as a way to reach into your community and find people that weren't going to church. The guy's name was Norman Wan. Now, this was, again... When you, when you go back to 1987, you know, there was not cell phones. There, the, at any level, there was not uh, answering machines. There were not uh, private numbers. And so the idea of using the phone uh, to call people and find people that weren't going to church was, was, to me, very attractive, especially if you're trying to reach people that weren't going to church, which was what God was laying on my heart. Now, again, as I say that today, that's what a lot of us do, Right? But 24 years ago, just to give you perspective, I, I, have the, I get this, this sense of where God is leading us. And a guy uh, who's a youth minister at the church where I've got an office once we get going, he hands me a, 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 a document, a piece of paper. It's from the Chicago Tribune. He says, this sounds like what you're trying to do. And it was about a church called Willow Creek Community Church that was just beginning to be known. I read uh, Joe Ellis's books, The Church on Target and The Church on Purpose, years ago. Great books to help you think about leadership. If you can find those today, I would encourage you a, a great focus on, on a target, uh, having a, a purpose to your church. But in one of those books, uh, Rick, uh, he mentioned a guy named Rick Warren. Again, now to you, who doesn't know Rick Warren? But at that time, who is this guy, Rick Warren? And I ordered some, some uh, cassettes. Uh, from Saddleback, and I listened to those things, and those, those things began to shape and form the vision and clarify the vision in me. And I'm going to talk more about how important it is that you, you continue to educate yourself around this. And so, so I, I go to this Fuller seminar, I get this sense of uh, we're, going to, we're going to make these phone calls, and we're going to trust God. Here's the interesting thing, too. I, I remember this very distinctly. Packing up to leave in Anderson, Indiana. And a guy that has been at the, this conference with me the whole time, we're just talking. I said, where are you going to plant a church? He said, Lexington, Kentucky. Really? That's where I'm going. And uh, uh, that church was near where we started. And uh, it, it, it uh, did not have a clear sense of where it was going to go and does not exist today. And I don't say that, I say that just sadly. It's been a reminder to me of, of how gracious God has been to me and to our Crossroads Church to, to, to bless it the way uh, that he has. But, but I, I sense that God could use me to create a vision that, that would be a church that was reaching new people. And, and I remember that this friend of mine that spoke in Indiana and talked about planting churches said, you know, planting a church... It is going out on a limb so far that if God isn't holding it up, it's going to break off. And I would suggest that that's where God wants us to be with regard to our vision for our church, whether it's a new church plant or existing church. What are we doing that if God isn't in it, it's not going to happen? I think for a lot of us, our vision uh, is, is something we know we can pull off. Instead of having to trust God to pull it off. You know, we, we chose the name Crossroads. Again, that name has become very popular. At the time, there was one other Crossroads, to my knowledge, in, in the whole United States. And, uh, but it, we chose that name because we were trying to reach people who were at a crossroads in their spiritual journey. And we were trying to provide new direction for searching people. And so we made 11,000 phone calls to people in a five-mile radius of our intended location. Now, again, here's how God was helping me figure out direction. In one of those phone calls, a lady named Debbie asked if she could speak to me. We are saying we want to be a church who 
for the unchurched, a, a church for those who have had toxic church relationships, and, and, a, and a church for those who have messed up. So Debbie asked to speak to me. She said, I'm just going to be really honest with you. I've had an affair. I want to know if I'm welcome in your church. I said, well, can you give me a little more detail? And so she did. I knew the church that she had come from, and I asked if I could speak to the pastor there. She granted me permission. And what I learned is that indeed that had happened, but that that couple was working on restoring their marriage. And this pastor felt it would be very good, that this was a good lady who'd made a very bad mistake, and it would be a good, good thing for her to come and be a part of us. Now again, God was clarifying in me and in us, are we really going to live into these things or not? Now again, I think 24 years later, we're a lot farther down that road. But again, back then, that was significant stuff. And uh, here's the interesting thing about Debbie. She ended up teaching my kids at Crossroads, meeting a wonderful man, and is happily married today. And I think that, that, that God was helping to clarify vision for me in that. And, and you know, God has honored that vision. Uh, we had, we had uh, an offer from two churches in Lexington. Lexington has some larger churches. And so we had one large church that offered us 100 people, and another offered us 50. And I said, you know, I don't want those people. And here's why. They're going to come with certain expectations. I want people that are drawn to our vision. I don't want someone expecting me to be, uh, you know, this, this preacher or that preacher. I want them to be captured by our vision and wanting to be a part of it. And I think for any of us, whether our church has been around for a long time or for a very short period of time, people need to buy into your vision. And out of that, decide whether this is the right place for, for them or not. And we wanted everyone coming in to be on the inside rather than on the outside. So if 100 people knew each other, and, uh, they, and then these, these people we phone call come in, what's going to happen? The new people are, are on the outside, and the, the people that know each other are talking to themselves and talking to each other. Instead of engaging. So, so what we did is we created an environment where everybody was new. Now, there was, a, there was a launch team, but those 50 people we gathered from various places. A lot of them new to Lexington. And they came all, and all excited about this vision of, of reaching people. And, uh, you know, we, we, uh, I want to mention this statement by Warren Bennis. Because he says, leadership is the capacity to translate vision into reality. What I'm trying to do is help to illustrate that to you. You know, it, it, we, we can have something great on paper, but we've got to be able to live it out. And God was helping that to become reality in my mind. And so our first service was in Shoney's Inn. Uh, and uh, we had 125 unchurched people from the phone calls we had made and another 50 in our launch team. And we had two services in the meeting room that, that first day because we were not a small church. We were a big church getting started. That was our philosophy. And, and I believe, people have asked me this, I believe that God would, would, would grow this church to be out of 1,000. I didn't know what that would be, but I just really had that sense that that's what God was wanting to do, and he's been more than faithful to that. I, what I want to do is I want to show you the, the first service that we did at Shoney's Inn, and uh, this will give you a chance to just, I want you, I want you to hear what is said about vision. And just apologize for some of the other aspects. Let's just watch the screen. <laughs> I had some people here that, that got a phone call. And, and, and they've decided they're in church today. And that is exciting. And uh, you don't know me from Adam. If you, if you got a picture in the paper, it looked like I had a little more hair than I do. Uh, that wasn't my fault. That's just the way it came out. I'm not trying to, <clears throat> to hide anything from anybody. It's just the way it is. Uh, I may have looked taller in that picture. You know, I'm sorry. But uh, we're excited. Uh, we really think that, that the Lord is going to use Crossroads Christian Church in, in a great, marvelous way to, to reach people for Christ. And we're trying to build a church for those that, that aren't in church. And so we're going to try and do some things that will reach out to you and, and to your friends. And we want your input. We want to know how we can do that the very best. And it's great to have support of some from other churches that have come today. So again... <clears throat> In our very first service, 
we're, we're trying to make it very clear what we're trying to do. And, and again, one of the things that, that we were even trying to help people understand is that you know, if, if you come with some other expectations, that's who we are. And, and again, we fleshed that out a lot more as we went along. But I remember, uh, I remember hearing at that How to Plant a Church uh, seminar that if, if, you wanna, if you're going to reach the shakers and movers, they have to sense direction and purpose in your church. And again, you get those people on board. You get buy-in from them. And they're going to help you move this ball down the, the field. I mean, it's a critical component. And so, again, that, that sense of where are we heading, that sense of vision is such, such an important thing. And part of effective <coughs> leadership is the right people buying into vision. There are those who can, who can uh, partner with you and make it happen. Uh, you know, I, I heard something the other day that, 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 that our, we're comprised, 30% of us are, are pioneers, and 70% of us are settlers. But about 90% of leaders are pioneers. And so part of what we have to do is we got to get those pioneers around us to help with the vision. And then we need some settlers to kind of keep the ter territory we've taken. You know, we can't just keep moving west if, if somebody's not kind of claiming the ground behind us. And so you need both, but you, you, need, you need some of those visionaries early on. And I was very fortunate because of vision, God brought some, some great partners in ministry that allowed us to collaborate around a vision and to, and to deepen it as time went on. You know, Jim Collins in his book, Good to Great, talks about getting the right people on the bus and then getting the, the people in the right seats on the bus. And it's so critical, and I think vision helps to do that. And I, I, I want to point out, too, that Jesus never called anyone to a tame life. He called them to do something bold and courageous. And, and, and again, I think vision, well, well thought out, is bold and courageous. You know, there's a military saying that, that says that generals who lead from the rear should have to take, should have to take it in the rear. You know, it, it's, it's not about... Uh, it's not about standing back, it's about leaning in, it's about living deeply into that vision. In, uh, James Cousas in his book Leadership Challenge says, only those leaders who act boldly in times of crisis and change are willingly followed. Let me say that again. Only those leaders who act boldly in times of crisis and change are willingly followed. Uh, look at what it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 16 and 17. See, uh, Apostle Paul speaking, and he says, he says, Therefore I urge you to imitate me. For this reason I have sent to you Timothy, my son whom I love, who is faithful in the Lord. He will remind you of my way of life in Christ Jesus, with it, which agrees with what I teach everywhere in every church. You know, it's so critical that not only do we, we, we cast a vision, but that we live that, that vision deeply. And I want to give you two examples of leadership. We're going we're gonna to show a couple more videos here. And, and you kind of look at these and tell, tell me which one you think people want to follow and maybe which one is more reflective of where, where church leadership can be sometimes today. So let's, let's show the first one from Braveheart. <laughs> which is more which is more representative you know of who we want to follow you know um and yet i mean I, fred couldn't get his, his uh, sweater zipped up i don't know if you noticed that i was feeling sorry for him you know? good man good man but again i i, I worry that in our desire to to even be godly sometimes we give this very meek and mild a leadership message. You know, I, I, I could watch Braveheart every week. I mean, I am ready to go into battle. You know, and, and you know, especially, I mean, you read that, I mean, you know that's based on a true story. And you know, that, that, that statement where he, he makes, you know, as you think about one day you're going to be lying in your beds and you're going to think back to this moment and you had a chance to take a stand. And you did. They were fighting for Scotland's freedom. And you and I are fighting for the freedom of men's and women's souls. And I would say we need William Wallace's and Wilma Wallace's, you know, that are leading God's church 
And, and if we can't get excited about a vision, how in the world can we expect our people to? I mean, I think we get what we ask for many times. And, and, and so, you know, to me, it's just, it's just a great image to think about. And, and you know, I, and I, I, I would say this, too. If you're going to reach men today, you're not going to meet, meet, reach them with Fred Rogers at the helm. You need William Wallace. And again, that's not being sexist. That's just, that's just the reality. There is a warrior in every man that needs to be called. So, uh, you know, Henry Ford said, uh, once said that to ask who should be the leader is like asking who should sing tenor in the quartet. The tenor should sing uh, tenor, of course, and the person who is gifted to lead should lead. And I think it, it, it goes on to say average leaders spend too much time speculating about people's reactions. What will they say? Who will be offended? How many people will leave? And superior leaders are primarily concerned with what God has instructed us to do in his word. You know, we, have, we, we live in an age today where we have created consumers and, and, and we, 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 can, we allow them to consume and we cater to them. I, I, I'm in a church culture that we've done some of that. And, and, and the fact of the matter is we need, to, we need to move people beyond that. We need to attract them to us, but then we need to introduce them to Jesus and disciple them to him and call them to a high call. And we need to, we need to be holding them back rather than pushing them forward, as they understand. You know, we, we started uh, this church for people that weren't going to church or, or had toxic faith relationships, uh, and, and there's so much of that out there. And we, we had to ask a couple things. One of the things I realized is, you know, I, I was not Rick Warren. I don't wear, you know, flowery shirts and no socks, and uh, I'm certainly not Bill Hybels. I mean, every illustration was about being out in a boat on, on the ocean somewhere, you know, with some very rich people, and that wasn't what, what I had. And so I had to figure out, how do I translate that to Lexington, Kentucky with Glenn Schneiders? I, and, and this was driven home to me a long time ago. I was at, I was at a, a, a chapel in seminary, and a, a guy named Wayne Smith came and spoke. And, and, and Wayne, they used to call the Bob Hope of the, of the restoration movement. I mean, he just was... Funny guy, great heart, but tell one joke after another. So I'm taking notes. I'm going to speak that weekend down in Rising Sun. I, oh, this is going to be great. I get up there, and I have a bomb because I am not Wayne Smith. And, and so that was a very important thing for me to realize. You have to, we have to learn from other people, but we have to figure out uh, what of that works in, in the context of where we are, and then what of that works with us. And then what if that seems uh, to kind of go along with what we sense God is saying to us? And I would ask you the question, are, are vision casters made or are they born? I think they're both. You know, I think there are, there are some people that, that are very natural at that, but I think God, God will, will, will do that in us too. I think he'll help to clarify that. And, and the bottom line is if you don't give direction as a preacher or church leader, you are left to every whim and desire of anyone with a plan and a bit of energy. You know, how do you know what to say yes to and what to stop doing? Because someone will be glad to give a vision if you don't have clarity around it. All of us get approached by some well-intentioned person that says, let me tell you what we ought to do. And if you don't have a vision to lay that beside, well, it's just your opinion against theirs. Now, again, you may be in a leadership role, but still, the easiest way to do that is to lay it beside your vision and be able to say, okay, does it, does it uh, work with that or does it not? Abraham Lincoln said, determine that the thing can and shall be done, and then we shall find the way. And again, we, we have to determine what is the thing that needs to be done. And if vision casting doesn't come naturally, then learn from people in churches that do it well. Again, I go back to as a, as a young man learning ministry. And, uh, and Bob Russell taught me a lot about communication and about application and even about humor. Bob's style of humor and mine are very similar. And, and he's, a lot, he's a lot greater communicator than I am, but I, I learned from him. But then as I, I try to figure out how do I communicate this message to unchurched people, Bill Hybels, 
being able to listen to him and just 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 think in the context of what's it like to t speak to an audience where you're, you're you're assuming a lot of people are not Christian that are there versus the assumption that we often make that everybody in the room is a card carrying member and uh, and and more recently I, I've been sitting at the feet of, of guys like Mike Breen uh, with a 3dm uh, learning community and Alan Hirsch uh, who's written The Forgotten Way, and trying to figure out where is the church heading today in this attractional versus missional model. And, and what I want to emphasize is I'm still figuring it out in today's world. What worked in 1987 will not work today. Now, that doesn't mean the vision has changed. It means the methodology has changed or is changing. See, the preacher must be the lead learner. And, and to discern what is helpful and what is not. Now, I will, I will tell you, there's a young man I know of, uh, not, not too far from me, and about every three months, he's got a new, latest, greatest idea. And he has grown that church from 1,000 to less than 500. Now, sometimes you have to do that to clarify vision, but, I mean, it, it's just, they, they don't know what they're showing up for. And it is killing a good church. And so we have to, again, we have to understand who we are. We have to understand our community. We have to look at our, our vision once we have determined that. And, and then we, we have to really say, okay, how does this work? Let me just give you an example. Right now, a couple books that I'm, I, I just read. Uh, the book Next Christians by Gabe Lyons. I mean, if you're going to reach 20-somethings, 30-somethings, you've got to read Next Christians. Because he, he, he has done the research. And he's talking about a lot of, of wonderful people that say, you know, I am a Christ follower, but don't connect me to the church. I'm really discouraged by what I see going on in the name of God. Now, again, that's not your church, that's not my church, but that's a reality for a lot of people. And we can be mad about that or frustrated about it. We've got to acknowledge that. I mean, uh, some deeply committed Christ followers that have seen the same sort of things you and I have in extreme settings, and, and they just say, I don't want to be connected with that. And I don't know about you, but I kind of cringe uh, when I'm on an airplane and someone says, what do you do? Because less and less do I find people saying, well, that's great. You know, they, they, there's this kind of pregnant pause. They pull away a little bit, you know, and then they try to think of some spiritual connection. I'm just seeing that more and more. And, and, and so we, we, uh, we, that, that's a book that's been helpful to me. Uh, another book, uh, uh, Necessary en Endings by Henry Cloud, which talks about uh, the fact that there is a, there's a, a, a life and a death. There's a cycle. And that we shouldn't, we shouldn't be afraid of endings. We need to celebrate them. We need to move on. We need to even encourage them. And it talks about, it's a business book, but it's a, it's a counseling book. It's an excellent book for somebody that, that's uh, dealing with a struggle in relationships or a struggle with addiction. And, and so, again, it's a business book for me. For me, I, I always want to, again, a Cloud is a Christian, uh, but I, I love to read uh, uh, books from the, the marketplace to understand and be able to, to reference as well. And then, and then the book Prodigal God by Tim Keller. So, you know, I've got, got a business book, I've got a, a, a personal growth spiritual book, and, and a book that's talking about culture, three books that I've just read. And, and Tim Keller uh, looks at, at the story of Luke 15, but he looks at it from the elder brother perspective primarily. And, and says, you know, we, we get enamored with the younger brother, and it's a great message, but the fact of the matter is it really was delivered more for the older brothers, the, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law that were there here in this thing. And the elder brother is the teachers of the law, and the Pharisees. So, again, and, and the reason I say that is we, we've got to be reading. We've got to, and what I've been done is in our staff, re, our most recent staff retreat, uh, we talked, uh, we, we unpacked Next Christians together. I shared some of that with our congregation in, in, a, in a message just recently. And uh, then we talked about uh, some missional stuff, and then we followed it up by Necessary Endings. And again, it was all about continuing to clarify uh, how do we continue to reach people, provide new direction for people that are searching in today's context in 2011 in Lexington, Kentucky. 
You know, I, I remember years ago, Vance Havner uh, had a young man come to him and say, you know, I want to be original or nothing. And Vance said, you know, you're both. <laughs> you're accomplishing it. And, and, and we need, I, I am not, I am, there's about, I think I read today, that about 2% of us that are really innovative, creative. I'm not one of them. But I am an early adopter. You know, I, I, I think God has given me some clarity around where I sense things are going, and it's allowed me to continue to hone vision. And so uh, right now, I just, I just came from a, a gathering called Future Travelers, uh, which, which is 10 pastors together talking about how do, we, how do we remain attractional but also missional in today's culture in large churches. Trying to clarify vision for us in today's setting. And, and, and vision casting cannot be delegated. You know, that, that's the thing. It, there, I think the title of this, of this uh, session is really important because as a primary communicator, you have to be a primary visionary. And Alan Hirsch in his book, The Forgotten Ways, Reactivating the Missional Church, says the, the pattern of a movement is usually set in a definitive sense by its founder. Therefore, in terms of the movement, of, movement dynamics and mission of the Christian church, this notion of modeling the message is absolutely crucial to the transmission of the original message beyond our, our founder to the subsequent generations. We have to model the vision. We can't just parrot it. We have to live it. I'll give you an example for me. If, I, if, if Crossroads is all about reaching people that are far from God, and I don't have any friends that are far from God, Tell me how that works. You all need to go do that. You all need to live into this vision. I have to be able to model that, and people have to see that. And the, and the, the vision casting can't be delegated, but the preacher is the primary vision communicator. Cater. And some of us are naturally gifted at that, but, but that is not an excuse for those of us that are not. You know, we have to, we have to assemble a team. You know, the, every one of us have in our churches some forward thinkers. And actually, uh, I think forward thinkers get kind of pushed down in a lot of churches because, because they, they can tend to raise a ruckus a little bit. And, and you have to figure out who are the malcontents and who are these visionary types. But we need to encourage that. We need to, you know, you need to have a coffee with, with the, the, the people that have that kind of sense and, and let them just breathe into you and talk with you and, and, and share with you. You need, you need elders that, that have a, a visionary sense. You need to attend seminars and read books. You know, I just had our, our, our elders and our staff uh, a year ago read the book Missional Renaissance by Reggie McNeil just to, to help us be thinking about what, what do we think about this? How does this apply to us? And, and so you know, having those learnings. I remember when we got involved with Willow Creek. Uh, I talked to Lee Strobel, who I got to know at Willow Creek, and I said, Lee, we got a problem. We're trying to do some of these things we've heard from you, but how do we, you know, how, where do we go with questions? We call up a willow and nobody can talk to us. And so Lee said to me, he said, well, let me tell you what we're thinking about doing. We're thinking about doing this thing called an association, where there'll be an association of churches and you'll get some insight into what's going on. We'll have a, have a seminar uh, every year around that. I said, Lee, you let me know when you start it, we're going to be a part of it. We're, we're church number 25 in the Willow Creek Association. I attended the first, uh, I, I, first leadership summit, wasn't called that, it was called with 100 people in California. Because again, I, I saw the need for that to help us clarify who we were in the context of today's culture. And, and so again, figuring out where those places are for you. It doesn't have to be a Willow Creek or anything like that. It wouldn't be today, most likely. But, but where is it? that you can go to be challenged and encouraged and live into your vision. Helen Keller said the most pathetic person in the world is someone who has sight but has no vision. She ought to know. But the fact of the matter is, uh, you've got to start by really asking God to make that clear to you and spending some time around that. One of the things I didn't say, and I'll mention a little bit more, but, but is the fact that, that early on for me, the beauty of starting a new church is you've got, you don't have a church yet, and so you've got a lot of time you got a lot of things to do, but it's a lot of time for you to really sit and reflect and say, okay, God, speak into me. You know, God, help me to do that. I'm gonna, I want to share something with you. Um, this is, uh, I got this from Mike Green at uh, 3DM, uh, and it just really challenged me. This is, uh, this is what they call the half circle, okay, which kind of makes sense. Um, and over here, this is based on... This is, this is based on uh, John 15. You know, if, if we abide in him, we're going to bear much fruit. 
over here is Abide, and he talks about uh, the pendulum, you know, and how a pendulum swings, and it swings based on energy. Now, here's what he said before he said that. He said, uh, I want you to think about creation, and I want you to think about what happened on day six. What happened on day six? Man's created, right? We're created. What happens on day seven? We rest. He says, do you realize that it's out of our rest we then work? Versus the other way around. We work and then we got to rest. It's a significant thing. He says, and he said, if you think about a pendulum and it's over here in fruitfulness, how do you become more fruitful? You, you can't push it up farther. It's got to go this way. It's got to go into abiding. And if we, if we don't, if the pendulum doesn't swing here to abiding, we can't swing back with more fruitfulness. And he also said that it's in, it's in your abiding that revelation happens. And I don't know where you are with that, and I'm not trying to make that beyond where you want to take it. But here's the thing I've found. When I'm able to have a break, and I'm rested, that's when clarity comes. It sure isn't when I'm tired and I am trying to push the pendulum on up toward more fruit. And, and, and for us, again, the way, the way that works is everyone on our staff has two days off together because we know if they don't have a day off, there's no way in the world there can be much rest in that day. There's all that stuff they got to do to get done and, and be with their families or whatever. And so we have determined we're going to give everybody a weekend just like our people have. And uh, when, we do a, when we do a staff retreat, this is the really cool thing. We, we, we didn't, I didn't see this, but it so confirms it. We, we, uh, uh, about five years ago, we hired Ruth Haley Barton to come and coach our staff in formation for two years. She wrote the book, An Ordinary Day with Jesus, with John Orford. Because we said, you know, our staff can't grow into formation stuff if, if they don't have some help in that. And so the way we start our staff retreat, if you've been with us, uh, on, on the Monday we had staff retreat, the first thing we did, first of all, we got down there, had a good night's sleep. And then on the Monday morning for the first half of the day, it was spent in solitude and silence. <clears throat> Followed by play. And then the next day we planned. So we rested and were refreshed, and then we moved into planning. And I, I, that's just a very, if, you, if, you're, if you're struggling to get that sense of vision and direction, I, I would really challenge you to, to do that. You know, to really think in terms of, uh, when, when is my abiding time? So that God can, you know, and, and, and those early days allowed me the time to be able to do that and have a clarity uh, around vision. So, make sense? Does it make sense to you all? I mean, again, that was Mike Green. Uh, you can read more about it in Building a Discipling Culture. Building Discipling Cultures, rather. Plural. Building Discipling Cultures, Mike Green. And I want to give him credit for that. Because if he knew I said that and didn't, I'd be in trouble. Okay, so... Here's the thing I want you to do, and, and, uh, and you all are going to have a break in, in just a, a couple minutes, but is really, you know, what is God calling your church to be? That, that in, my, in my sense, is your assignment, <laughs> whether that's, that's today or sometime down the road. But what is God calling your church to be? And, and why is this vision so important? Because without clear vision, it's hard to know what to say yes to and what to say no to. You know, I, when I was at that uh, How to Plant a Church seminar, they said, don't be surprised if the first people to greet you are the first pe people to leave you. And I said, you know, they don't know how winsome I am. That's just not going to be the case. And it was absolutely the case. Matter of fact, we had three trustees when we started Crossroads. Uh, and uh, I was one and there were two others. One was actually the president of the men's fellowship that started the church. The other was an influential uh, 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 leader in the church. He was a dentist. They were the two top givers. And inside the first year, they left the church over vision issues. The one guy wanted a Sunday night service so that other churches could come and visit. Meanwhile, every, in Lexington, 24 years ago, they were still Sunday night service. Everybody said, get me out of Sunday night service. And, and I, I, you know, if you're reaching new people that are just beginning the faith, are they going to come Sunday morning and Sunday? I made no sense. But had, had I caved to that, I guarantee you today, I would not still be there. 
because that was a vision issue. And, because I, and that's what I did. I, I talked to him, and I said, okay, let's just think about what we're doing here. Let's think about vision. Is, is it, if we're reaching new people, is it more important for us to have a Sunday night service or maybe something even midweek that kind of get them back to re-energize or, or to get them into a small group? Do we really think the second most important thing is Sunday night? You know, I had done an exercise with, with, with our leadership team at the time, a vision team, and, and I did a little thing where you, you write a piece of paper with the word judgment. I said, okay, you know, now put it on your seat and everybody sit on it. We're going to just vision cast. And I remember in that meeting, we, we were vision casting, and, and some young guy that we had reached through phone call, I said, you know what I want to do? He said, I want to have a dance in the, in the church one day. And this other guy jumps out of his seat, off his judgment, and said, that'll never happen as long as I'm here. Well, we've had a dance, and he's not there. <laughs> so, and, and the fact of the matter is, there, there are times where that has to happen in order for the vision to go forward. But here's the thing, we cave, these are the two top givers, and we cave, you know, to issues that are secondary, in my opinion, as tough as that can be, instead of holding strong to, to the vision. So, that's where we're going to stop right now, and uh, take a break, and then we'll come back. Well, let's, let's move on. Uh, again, uh, I want to make sure we get through some things that, that are imper important for us. But I like this quote by David Gergen. He says, a leader's role is to raise people's aspirations for what they can become and to release their energies so they will try to get there. And again, one of the things I've seen in, in, uh, around vision and leadership is we want to micromanage. Uh, we, we, instead of being this, this place where we release people to do ministry, we control people many times. And, uh, and, and I, what I've seen is, particularly in, if I were to categorize one of the issues in churches where they struggle around leadership and vision, uh, you have some small-minded leaders that are scared to death that if they release something, it'll go awry. And it will at times. But we've got to try, you know, we, there's got to be a greater level of trust. We've got we to disciple these people and, and bring them around us. But, but we, we can't micromanage this thing. You know, uh, Home Depot says, uh, you can do it, we can help. And that's, that needs to be the attitude of the church. You can, great idea that's consistent with our, with our vision. How can we help? Now, that doesn't mean we're going to resource it. It doesn't mean we're going to throw staff to it. But, but instead of, instead of you know, pouring the cold water, pushing it down, what happens? I, I read just something today in Dave Ferguson's book, On the Verge. He said, say yes, but without funds or staff. If you really want to watch your church begin to get creative around some of this. And I know that gets a bit scary. But I, I think that good leaders figure that, again, that risk is... How do I walk this line? I've always said, you know, there's a fine line between faith and foolishness. And I want to be right on the razor edge. And we've got, to, we've got to have some discernment around this, but we've, got to, we've also got to release our people. I mean, because this idea of releasing their energies so they'll try, try to do it. Again, I think part of the problem in our churches many times is we, it all falls on us because we, we just micromanage it to death. And vision is not a popularity contest. It does not cave to opposition. Again, early on in that, in that new church, uh, I, would, I, would, uh, I can remember one of our elders said this. He, he took, us, it took me to see a family, friends of his. He said, I couldn't believe what you did. We sat in their living room, and you basically told them why you didn't think they should be a part of the church. And I did, because they were Christians. And uh, they, they uh, were a little bit older, and based on who we were reaching, I just, and, and I just felt a lot of times they, they were kind of set in their ways. And, and uh, here's the thing. That lady to this day is, is a, a volunteer in our, in our uh, uh, administrative area. They loved it. But, but the guy that, that, that sat with me is our executive pastor. He said, I, just, I was so drawn by the fact that you, you weren't trying to convince them. You were actually just being very clear on who you were, and then actually kind of talking them out of it rather than, than uh, trying to draw them in. And I, I think there, there is some of that sense. One of the things I do in, uh, in our, in our uh, new members classes or when we're with new people, we'll, we'll say, let me tell you who we are. And, uh, and, and if that's not who you are, then let us help you find the place to go. But this is who we are. 
And uh, the other thing we, we do with regularity is says, let me tell you how we handle conflict around here. In Matthew 18, it says, if I have a problem with you, I go to you. And if that doesn't get resolved, then I, I bring you know, an elder or leader alongside. So I said, don't ever come to me to talk about somebody else, because I'm going to march you across the room to them. And if you don't want to talk to them, don't talk to me about them. I've also always said to our leaders, I'm going to defend you in public, and I'm going to challenge you in private. And the interesting thing, really, in the 37 years of ministry, uh, my elders, I am an elder at Crossroads, my elders and the staff have always been some of my dearest friends. Because we really are around the vision together. And we're figuring this thing out together. And so we don't talk about each other, we talk to each other, we practice Matthew 18. And vision is not a popular contest, it does not cave to opposition. Vision clarifies where resources uh, are distributed. And for us, it has always been about how does this help new people? It does, we, we do not have charter members at Crossroads. And that was very intentional because we didn't want anybody to say, well, let me tell you, I've been here for a very long time, so I've got more power than you. Our question has always been, whether it's a, you know, a, a new building or staffing or whatever it, be, it might be, our program, how does this affect new people? And when you ask that, it prevents you from just really getting it all about us. I want to show, show a video here because I, I was talking uh, at the break about how we have to live into this vision and this idea of, of building relationships with, with people that are far from God. And so this is out of a, a message that I shared uh, back, I think, in July. All to be in the world, but not of the world. And I think too many Christians have just pulled completely out of the world. And we have to figure out where to draw the lines. And you know, some of us, what we really want is somebody like me give us exactly what you can do and what you can't do. And that's the real growth is figuring that out for yourselves. And I, I find lots of bunkered in, hunkered down Christians love to make disparaging remarks about those who are determined to live in this world as salt and as light. You know, some of you know, uh, I, I love to play golf and uh, I played it, you know, for, for most of my adult life, and uh, I, I, I've played in a, in a men's league for at least the last 12 years with, with a group of guys that, uh, that is, uh, is a place where I get to be uh, some of the God flavoring along with others and, and some, bringing some of the God colors into that environment. And uh, it, it is a time for me, I, I just, I, I played Tuesday night, and I, I was just with, with some of the guys afterwards, and, and you know, I'm just convinced uh, there, uh, that time in that, in that uh, clubhouse is as important as anything I do. And, and as long as, as we make the playoffs, I'm fine with that. <laughs> but I want you to hear me. You know, especially if you're one of those league, league guys, because a number of guys that play in that league now come here to church. You are not a project to me. You're a friend. You are someone that I value and someone who I just want to do life with. And I'm grateful that those guys will include me into that place. See, too many well-intentioned Christians have deserted the world for sterile, safe church buildings. So again, you know, for me, it's, it's very important. To, to, that's a very real thing. We have a church league, and I've never played in it. Uh, and, you know, people come see, talk about the golf league, and I said, well, I don't know about it. I hear it's a good thing, but this is where I play. And, and I can remember, uh, there was a guy named uh, Tucker, and we were playing one night in league, and uh, I, he said to me, and Tucker, uh, I, he probably, I don't know how many drinks he'd had at this point, but he, he said to me one time, so, you know, I drink a little too much. I said, yeah, Tucker, I know that. We need to work on that. But Tucker said to me, he said, let me tell you why I don't go to church. He said, uh, my mother and I, I as a little kid, we were in a church, and it was a church where they voted on membership. And the person, the family that they were voting on was of a different color. And the church voted them down for membership. And he said, my wife, or my mother stood up and said, this is the last time I'll be in this blankety-blank church. 
And I said to Thacker, I said, you know, it would have been my last time too. The very next Sunday, I speak. And you could have knocked me over with a feather when I'm <coughs> down after speaking, and up comes Tucker. He now works in our nursery. We don't know who's controlling who when he's back there. <laughs> but I mean, that's what it's about. <clears throat> And uh, one of the neatest guys, I mean, loves his kids. But th that was a pivotal moment. And, uh, and, and so, you know, being able to, to just live into that vision is such an important thing. You know, vision clarifies where resources are withheld, too. You know, the, the fact of the matter is, uh, uh, Henry Cloud says this in the book, Necessary Endings. The pruning moment is that clarity of enlightenment when we become responsible for making the decision to either own the vision or not. If we own it, we have to prune. If we don't, we have decided to own the other vision, the one called average. And again, guys and gals, if, if you know, vision helps us to be able to say, no, we can't do that. Or in order to do this, we're going to have to cut some other stuff away. You know, Collins talks about our to-do list and our not-to-do list. And if you're going to add something to the do list, what, what has to come off? Or, or what are we going to no longer resource? Because dollars must flow to vision. And vision determines hires. You know, vision determines what next buildings or, or, or not buildings. You know, we, we built uh, multi-purpose. We always have. And uh, I can remember when we built our most recent worship facility, it has two gym floors in it. We have to put down 1,000 to 1,200 chairs every weekend. Guess who didn't like that? The guys who put up chairs. <laughs> and I said, you know, we are, we're not going to spend more money to have fixed seating. We, I mean, think about the, how we can use this facility 24-7. It was about vision. And knowing that the facility can be used as much uh, to reach people in, in the things that are done besides the weekend service. Matter of fact, I want you to see, here's a video from uh, when we, uh, our 15th anniversary, uh, I, I, I'm talking a little bit, I mentioned a lady named Jody Rose who came to faith very early, but I want you to hear what, what uh, our architect picked up about buildings for us. And you may not have been around those first days, but, but you need, need, need to realize that CrossFit has never been about buildings. That's why Shoney's Inn or, or the Lakeview building that we talk about are just, or just vehicles to be used by God. An architect, that, as we were designing this building, said, you know, it's really interesting. I mean, buildings aren't that important to you. It's just, they're just tools to accomplish God's work. And I thought, boy, you know, for someone to catch that was, was so true. See, this is a celebration of what happens when we lead people in a new direction toward a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. People like Jody Rose that you heard from. I mean, you know, some of you have seen Jody dance, do drama, and you, you maybe know Jody, and you just think she's been a Christ follower all of her life. <laughs> but she showed up the second week with her husband. And when she was baptized, she was baptized with her daughter, Sadie. Uh, she kind of got a two-for-one deal, you know, on that. <laughs> and now her daughter Sagan and her dance together, and uh, we watched her grow. And it, it, it is uh, fair to say that her life and that of her family has been changed forever. And there are many Jodies whose lives have been changed by God at Crossroads. As Stella Wallace mentioned, six months into the life of Crossroads, we merged with, with a group called the Lakeview Christian Church, taking possession of their metal building at 3712 Arbor Court, which is, is kind of at the corner of Trent Boulevard and, and Man of War. And Thelma has told me on more than one occasion that God had them build that building so that we could join them and use it to reach many searching people. Now think about this. Those mature people handed over the keys, their financial resources, all rights and decisions. I mean, it is the most wonderful display of maturity that I think I've ever seen in the church. And we went from rented facilities one day a week to a permanent facility seven days a week. And we grew in that middle building to four services. And life after life was being changed. 
People were coming and bringing their friends. Many seeking people were finding answers to their spiritual questions. And, and the story doesn't end there. We purchased 11.4 acres at 4190 Todd's Road. And in order to build some momentum, we did, and to remind us that we had grown into a larger church, because this metal building would only hold about 150 per service. So everybody's thinking, well, we're just this nice little church. But we're really up, upwards of 500 people. We said, let's get them all together. And so what we determined to do we, we chose that instead of having three services in a room that would hold 150, we would have a service under a big tent on the property. And again, that was about just uh, casting vision for, uh, for where we need to go. And again, we never built to make it nicer for us. We built because we needed to create space for our friends to be able to come and learn about God. You know, this, this metal building that, that we mentioned, sorry. And, uh, I really is a good picture of me. Um, speaking, yeah, speaking <laughs> that, that metal building that we were in. Here, I want to I tell you how this went down because it's again, it's about vision. We we get a phone call from uh, this group called the Lakeview Church, and they said our preacher has resigned. We've got this this metal building. It's nine thousand square feet on uh, uh, three acres. Uh, it's it's uh, the land's paid for. The equity position is about a hundred and it was about one hundred and thirty-five thousand plus. They had twenty thousand dollars in the bank. And so they said, we'd like to talk to you about merger. So I pulled together our, our leadership team. I said, okay, we're going to go over talking about merger. What, do we, what, what needs to happen? I said, okay, number one, it's no longer Lakeview. It's got to be Crossroads because it's a new, now it's a new deal. Their leaders have to resign because there can't be two directions. They need to give us the keys and, we need, we, and have no control over what happens inside the building. Because that is not a merger. That's a takeover, right? <laughs> <laughs> and, and we knew it wouldn't happen. But, that, but we also knew there could not be two directions. There can't be two factions fighting for how we're going to be. So that night, we made that presentation, and they said, well, our elders have decided to resign. Again, we didn't know they had, had $20,000 in the bank. They said, we got $20,000 in the bank. Uh, our only question is, is it okay if we come back? That's really the way it went down. I'm not kidding you. And, uh, and we said, oh, one other thing. We don't want you joining as a block. There is no more like We're just crossroads again. The really cool thing is our treasurer, uh, until, until she struggled with Alzheimer's, was from that group. The uh, electrician and the roofing company, both those companies that did our subsequent buildings were from that group of people. And it really was one of the most mature just God-ordained things I've ever seen. But again, had we not clarified vision, it would have been so easy to just, I mean, we're one day a week in Shoney's, you know, it would have been so easy to just ignore those things. But we had to align around vision to make it happen. Let me talk about some application. Uh, that, uh, I want you to see that true vision comes from God. Again, I, I'm, I'm showing, sharing some things, but I sense that God was saying something in me. And the really cool thing is I sense that and then I begin to go some places, and God is breathing that into me. Again, didn't, there, there was not a, a, a seeker model at that point. There was, uh, that I was aware of, you know, the saddleback idea of going out and asking five questions, the key questions, it was, it, was not, it was not there until we jumped into it. And it was just this sense in me that God was wanting to use new churches to, to really reach new people, and that we've got it first and foremost ask that question of what's going to make them feel comfortable. And again, a lot of what we do today, 24 years ago, was, was really almost off the chart. And I, I remember reading a scripture that just really hung with me. It's Ephesians 3, 20 and 21. And I began to pray that. I began to pray, now God, I want you to, be, to do more, immeasurably more than we can even ask or imagine. I don't know what that means, but I don't want us to be limited by what we think can, can happen. And I want you to show your power at work within us. And so we make these 11,000 phone calls to people within a five-mile radius of where the church is going to begin. And we would call them. We'd say, hey, I'm Glenn Schneider's with the New Crossroads Church starting in your area. Could I ask you a couple quick questions? And the first question was, are you active in a local church? And if they said yes, we said, hey, that's great. We're not looking for people. We're looking for people who don't have a church home. Now, sometimes people say, well, I haven't been to that church in years. And they would want to engage us. Sometimes, sometimes they, they would you know, get kind of profane. Now, those are the ones we'd call back because we knew we really wanted them. <laughs> <laughs> but, but it was amazing how God just bring, brought people together. So, so we, we gather, 
And about four weeks in, uh, uh, an older lady that, that was kind of outside our demographic, but that was not going to church anywhere, we had a phone call drive, driving an old Crown Victoria, comes up to me after the, the services and hands me a, a check. It's folded in half. And uh, she said, I just believe in what you're doing. Now we had, I need to say, we had, we had uh, spent $5,000 to, to do the telemarketing and the mailers, and we didn't have that money. I just said to our, our people, you know, God, I just think God's in this, and if he is, he's going to show up. He's going to do more than we can ask or imagine. So we just, we just took that $5,000 and borrowed it and, uh, and just risked it. And uh, so she hands me this check, and, you know, in that day, uh, we didn't have a treasure at that point, and, and so stuff would kind of go through, through me sometimes. And so I, I waited until she left, and I'm thinking, you know, She's obviously on fixed income, you know, you know, if, if this is $100, it's a huge deal from her that she would do this. With a check for $20,000. Somebody with phone call. You know, if you don't think that didn't just invigorate our people to say, let's take the next hill. Remember a lady named Catherine that we called it? She, she was one of the fun ones because she actually wanted to talk. She would call us back and say, are you guys still going to meet? And uh, so she shows up with her husband, David, and their son. Now, here's the cool thing. I could just tell immediately that David was not nearly as comfortable in church settings as she was. And so I began to get around David and talk to him. And so one day, several weeks in, I said, David, if you don't mind me asking, what do you do? He said, well, I'm glad you asked. He said, I'm the general manager of WDKY television station here in Lexington. And I just, I, I just really love what you're doing here. And I've been thinking about it. I'd like to offer you a studio and a producer, and we will produce commercials for you to run at Christmas time for free, if that'd be okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, we'd be really ticked, David. I mean, there's no way we could do that. I mean, and again, this was, guy, as it turned out, a guy who came to faith at Crossroads. Still in that searching uh, mode that God uses to provide advertising for us that we could have never afforded because of a vision that was being lived out that he could identify with. And, and we have just seen that over and over and over again. And I think it's, it, it, it's, it's, again, so much to do with vision. You know, and, and, and again, I want you to think about, as you're thinking about this, what has God uniquely designed you to be? It's not crossroads, unless it is crossroads. <laughs> but, but for the rest of us, you know, it, it's not. And so, so what, what has he uniquely designed you to be? What, what is, is your calling as a church? What, what is the needs? What are the needs within your local community that, that God may be laying on your heart to follow through on and to fulfill? It, it's, it's not about what's the latest, greatest methodology. It's what has God uniquely designed you to be and do. You know, I, I like what it says, uh, uh, what, what Mordecai said to Esther, that God had appointed her for such a time as this. And, and it really, I think, is that, it's that abiding time where we get away and say, okay, God, what is it? What, you know, maybe, maybe it's the vision that you have, and it just needs to be tweaked. Maybe, though, it's a, it's a redirect, and there's some real time to, to have to think that through. But what has God appointed you to do? And, and uh, trusting him and his ability to work through you. You know, I, I always like to, I'm always comforted by the fact that, that God spoke through a donkey one time and he can do it again. You know, Balaam's ass, you know, he used. And, and the fact of the matter is, I, 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 my wife reminds me of that regularly. At times, so, you know. But the fact of the matter is, you know, it was so important for me to understand that I am uniquely designed by God to be Glenn Schneider. And, uh, and the crossroads has a very special place in his kingdom. And that's all we're called to be. And if we do that and do that, that well, it's going to be a God honoring and, and we're going to be blessed. You know, I think it was Rick Warren, I don't know if it's original with him, but he says vision leaks. And the fact of the matter, it, it does. You know, and that's why it, it, it was fun for me even looking back at different things, just seeing how, how that, that relating to vision and to our people is just a regular part of what we do. And, and you ought to preach a vision series at least once a year, but you ought to tell vision stories regularly in your teaching. 
And I think there are a couple of key vision questions that we ask. One is, how does this affect, uh, decision affect new people? Uh, again, I watch this sometimes around our vision. So you know what? We need to have this, this new service for new people. And we're going to have it at 8 a.m. on Sunday. Because we couldn't have it at 11 a.m. when everybody wants to come. Okay. There's the problem. If, if we really get it, how are, we, how are we going to default to what matters to them the most? You know, figuring out a time that's going to work for them rather than, than again, somehow thinking we're going to reach them, but we're going to try and get them at a time when they wouldn't come. And, and again, the more our, our people begin to really get that, the less of this consumer mentality that, that is, uh, so plagues the church today. So we regularly ask this question, how does this affect, decision affect new people? And again, I just go back to, to, to different initiatives, a lot of them uh, uh, around uh, money or energy, and it, it's always about asking our people and, and encouraging our people and thanking our people for the fact that they're willing once again to sacrifice uh, for their, uh, their potential younger brothers and sisters in Christ. You know, I, I, I'm always amazed. I'm a grandparent. I've been a grandparent for the last uh, four years now, and it is the coolest thing. Uh, but it, in the church, a lot of the spiritual grandparents expect the babies to conform to them instead of the other way around. You know, as a, as a grandparent, I'll read the same book over and again. I'll sing songs, I'll get in uncomfortable positions, make all sorts of sacrifices for those kids. But in the church, it's about rights and privileges. And so the opportunity to, to forego those for the sake of my grandkids. Preaching. You know, I, I, you know, in Hebrews, Hebrews 5, where it talks about, you know, the meat of the word versus the milk, and the whole implication is there, you know, all of us that, that, that uh, have been in ministry, any length of time, have somebody come to us and say, you know, I'm not being fed. And I really want them to look at Hebrews 5 and say, okay, but, you know, do you feed yourself, you know, physically, or do you expect, you know, do I need to come over and cut your food up for you? And, you know, do the airplane thing, get in your mouth. I mean, you know, that, that whole thing, it's just amazing to me. And, 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 and even, even that feeding is, is, the implication is that it's then to be used for the edification of the body of Christ. And I am convinced that what we, don't, we don't need to feed people more. We need to get them exercising. We need to get them using their faith. You know, if you get somebody discipling someone else, somebody walking alongside a new Christian or someone that's it's early in their faith journey, they're not going to have those issues. Because they're, they're beginning to answer questions for themselves. They're, they're beginning to, to really get it. So we ask this question, how does this decision affect new people? And, and I, this other question, we, I think we first uh, had this asked by an external focus emphasis that we did. If your church ceased to exist, would anyone in your community care or notice? I'm not talking about the church community. I'm talking about the community in which your church resides. Or would it just not even be a blip on the radar? That's been a huge thing for us in recent years. Of saying, how are we impacting the community around us? <clears throat> you know, and again, that, that, that external focus. Our, our, uh, our hope is someday that, that our multi-purpose facility is renamed. It, it, the, you know, the Andover Community Center where Crossroads Christian Church meets. Because the facility is actually used more for the community than it is for us. That in our minds is, is truly being the church. It's that, that meshing of the community and the church together. I mean, I, that, I, that, that's our, and that, again, it goes back to, I'm so glad we, we held the line on this multi-purpose nature. Because it gives us that ability. There's a little community that's, that's two miles from us that we are investing huge energy and resource into to be the church in that community and to, and to do things like after school programs and mentoring programs and uh, both with the kids and with their parents to, to really invest in them. And to have them involved in, in our athletic leagues with our kids. And, uh, and as, as there's a, a kind of a big brother, big sister relationship to those kids, those kids becoming very comfortable with us and becoming uh, comfortable with Crossroads. 
You know, Bill Heibel said, good enough is not good enough when it comes to honoring God through the church. In response to his holiness and greatness, in gratitude for his monumental sacrifice for us, our attitude ought to be to pay tribute to him with the best we can offer. And I'm not talking about obsessive perfectionism, but rather an attitude of excellence that permeates all we do in the church and in our personal lives. After all, what we do as Christians reflects on the Christ we serve. And I think clarified vision allows us to ask the right questions, to get the right results, that allows us to do the most important things. Not just be busy. It's not hard to be busy in the church, is it? But to be busy around the right things. You know, a clear vision unites the right people and it runs off the wrong ones. That's very important. You need to hear that. Clear vision unites the right people and runs off the wrong ones. We have not had a major division in 24 years at Crossroads because we ask the question, how is this going to affect the new person coming in? Not what are the rights and privileges of those that have been here the longest? And I, I really do think, I mean, we. the other thing is, uh, because of that Matthew 18 principle, we don't have a lot of people pulling people aside and factions being created. I don't have a lot of people coming to me because they, they know that that's how we're going to deal with it. And, and so there, there's, there's, either, there's either healthy resolve or people just realize they're not going to have a way in this community. And as a result, we, you know, again, I, I just go back to, uh, to some of those very earliest days uh, and how critical it was that we held that. And I go back even farther. When I was in, in Indiana, and I was 20 years of age when I went to Rising Sun, and I began to preach there. I went there one weekend to fill in. I filled in for 13 years. And uh, we, uh, we grew. Uh, we, were, uh, we were in a 150-year-old building with uh, stained glass windows. It was a beautiful old building. And we were out of space. And so uh, we just had to move. And, I, and, and the, there, you know, in a lot of smaller churches, there's a power broker. And the power broker was Harold Clifton. And you know, I can remember, I said, we got, it. we got to do something. And Harold said, I can tell you right there, that's where my mother sat. That's where her, her grandmother sat. My, they were baptized in this church. We were married in this church. They were buried in this church. It ain't happened. That stained glass windows, I mean, we can't do that. And Harold was an elder. And I'd go up to Jack's, which is a local restaurant, and I had coffee with the boys about every morning. Again, that was kind of a place for me to interact with people. And I just kept spending time with Harold and then talking to Harold about this. And one day, Harold came down to my office. He said, you know what I've realized? He said, 20 years ago, I was a young deacon at the church. And we were going to build the, that Sunday school wing that's on the back of, of this building. And there was an old elder named James Devon. And he was opposed to it. He said, there's no way we can do that. He said, you know, we'll not be able to pay for it. He said, you know, we got James out of the way, and in 20 months we had the thing paid for. And here's what I've realized. I have become James Devon. I'm in. He actually became the, uh, the, our representative in the whole building project. He had a construction background and saw the thing through from beginning to end. But again, I just got up beside him. I spent time with him. I loved him. And God did work. Now, again, there, there are some times you get up against someone and, you know, it's his way or your way or whatever. But there are other people that we just, we just need to continue to build that relationship in. And that's where discernment and sensing from God becomes a very, very important part of that. We actually took a, a, a couple of stained glass windows from that old building and brought him into the new building. It was a great way to kind of understand some needs for those people, but also to move forward. And, and literally, was the biggest thing that happened in Rising Sun in 50 years. And that church is the, the focal point, uh, spiritually, in that community today. I got a chance to go back there just a few months ago at a dedication of another, another building, and it's just really cool to see how that vision has continued on. See, as time goes on, vision is clarified with new, new uh, methods for the same vision. Again, for us, it, 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 is, it is still asking the same questions, just figuring out in today's context what that looks like. You know, uh, I'll give you a couple examples of that because uh, it was just helpful for me. Uh, I, back, uh, 
I don't know how many years ago, I read something that said at the time, the number one service that unchurched people were most likely to come to was Christmas Eve. I don't know if it was because of candles and it's dark or whatever or what, but, but and at the time, this was back in it, where the kind of Christmas pageant was a big thing, and in Lexington, you had a couple churches doing really big pageant stuff, and there's no way you can compete with that. And I said, here's what we're going to do. We're going to have one of the very best Christmas Eve services in town. And uh, we're going to, and we're going to, you, you know, anybody on staff, I'm sorry, but you're with us through Christmas Eve. You know, there's no going home early uh, because this, this is a critical opportunity for us to reach people. And, uh, and so we have done that. And uh, here's the other thing that that played out. A few years back, we, we had Christmas Eve services, and then Sunday was Christmas Day, and uh, we didn't have services. And uh, that was consistent with who we are. I'm not saying you should do this, but that was just consistent. We had, we had 3,000 people for Christmas Eve uh, that, that wanted to be there, could be there with their kids. They got a chance to celebrate, and then we were able to take Christmas Day off. We got, that, that got out, and I got calls from Fox News and uh, other news agencies, and... Uh, uh, because it was just hard to believe that, that, that we were making that choice. We were not making that choice against God. We were making that choice to say, okay, we're going we're gonna to meet when we can get the most people there. And uh, we're going to also realize that for our people, when we ask them to do that, sir, we're going to also let them rest and celebrate Christmas with their, their family and their kids the next day. But we, we did that Christmas Eve, and, and uh, again, that's, that's something we continue to this day. Now, what we do is we give our staff off the week after Christmas. And it's a dead time in the church and gives them a chance to, to really rest and to recuperate. Um, I, the other thing that I've realized is as a church that we do not do maintenance well. And so multi-site has been an effective way for us to continue to grow and create community. The, the cool thing about multi-site for us, and we have a second campus in Georgetown. We're adding a third one in Richmond uh, in January of next year. Is I say to people, if you want to see us in the early days, Go to Georgetown and see, you know, see the campus there. And it gives, it, it gives people a chance to, to see the vision uh, afresh. And uh, again, it, it could be, uh, it could be uh, for you a lot of different things. It could be supporting church plants as a way to keep that vision. You know, again, some of us are in areas where there's not going to be a lot of growth. So how do, we still, how do we still promote growth? Well, we have a vision for church planting and, and for the kingdom in that way. Or we, we're living in an area that's depressed, and so how can we really be the church in that, that more inner city or rural area that, that is depressed economically? How do we care for widows and, and orphans? Uh, and so for us in recent times, besides multi-site, the other thing that's helped us with casting vision is this whole idea of being the church. Because uh, one of the most effective ways today to evangelize people is not to get them in your front door on a weekend, but it's to get them serving alongside you in your community. People are more inclined to do that. And, we, and so we, we have begun uh, to, to really emphasize that. I gave you all some handouts. That just uh, a, a couple weeks back, we did a, a Be the Church weekend, and this is our program. It's a magnet that we give out that the people just remind of, and then it gives you the most recent uh, serving opportunities. But I want to give you a quick uh, a video support of this. Uh, this will be the last video we look at that just was that Be the Church weekend, where we, what we do now is uh, in January, we, we made this, uh, came up with this idea that we want to do this, and once a quarter, we have a Be the Church weekend where we kind of give an update of what's going on. So let's just watch this next video. This morning to those at our Georgetown and our Andover campuses, uh, we are so glad that you can join us on a weekend where we have a very special emphasis. Back in January, we challenged you to stop going to church, and instead, we challenged you to be the church. Because for too long, the church in America has huddled behind closed doors while real needs that we can respond to go unmet. And those who are investigating faith look at that disconnect to real world, I world issues and they find it very inconsistent with the, the teachings and the life of Jesus Christ. So in order to not lose sight of this commitment, once a quarter we have been doing a Be the Church weekend. And we're giving you some updates uh, of things that are happening. And it's, it's, it's really neat because some of the things we're just learning of we have, we have no input or impact on. And, and I love the fact that it's not about crossroads. 
It's about people just simply living out their faith. At our staff retreat this past week, I learned of some empty nesters in Richmond. They're a part of our Richmond campus core team. They're helping with a food pantry because they heard this challenge and they accepted it. You know, we introduced a new word back in January to you. It's the word missional. And the idea of being missional means that the church exists to be missionaries by going into our workplaces and neighborhoods and areas outside our culture and comfort and living sacrificially in those areas for the good of others. See, every Christ follower is called to be a missionary. Mission is about going instead of sitting. And unfortunately, for too long, the church has expected the world to come to us instead of going to them. Jesus, in what has been called the Great Commission, commanded his followers. He didn't suggest. This was a command. Notice what he says. It's Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20, in the Bibles that we give out at both our campuses. He says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So wherever you go, some translations say, as you go, make disciples of all nations. Baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Teach them to do everything I have commanded you. And remember that I am always with you until the end of time. Again, the implication is as you go, not if you go. And people have taken up that challenge. We had five trips to Joplin this summer to help in relief efforts there. Uh, today, there are people that are a regular part of Church Under the Bridge in Lexington, and they'll be serving that homeless community, that homeless church. And they do that on, on a regular rotation. They are simply being the church. Yeah, there's a little more to that, but uh, we actually showed a video of, uh, of some of our two 14-year-old girls in Georgetown who on their own, their own money, their own time, did a backyard VBS for kids in their neighborhood mm. because they wanted them to experience what it's like to be the church and, and to, to experience the love of Jesus. So uh, just a couple other thoughts and we'll be done. You know, I, 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 uh, I love this quote by Christopher Reed that says, so many of our dreams seem impossible, then improbable, then inevitable. And you know, some of this, you get up against it and you can think, I, I don't know. <laughs> you know and, and I realize it's hard. You're gonna have to have some wisdom to know you know, how quickly you push on some things. But boy, we gotta clarify uh, around vision. I, I was, again, in the book On the Verge, uh, Dave Ferguson and Alan Hirsch uh, mentioned the advice that General Eric Shineski gave to Donald Rumsfeld. He said, if you don't like change, you're going to like irrelevance even less. <laughs> and we have to figure out, I'm not, I'm not gonna figure that out for you today. You know, wh where is the church heading? But we gotta figure that out. And you gotta figure out where your church is heading. And, and we have got, Jack Welch said this, change before you have to. And we have to innovate without abandoning. And so I just would encourage you as you're thinking about this, just, just what has God called you to do? And remember that he is a God that is able to do immeasurably more than all that we can ask or even imagine. And his power is at work within you to do powerful and wonderful things. And my prayer is that the church is released in all its power to make a change in your world and in mine. Thank you very much for letting me share with you. Today.